So, okay, we've been in this uh, series. I, by the time you get to three weeks, that's a series, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, that's, that's a series. So, um, uh, when everything goes wrong, the adventure begins. Um, I was slow getting to that because in my life it was like everything goes wrong. <laughs> you know, but I really, no, no, maybe God has something more for us. Uh, maybe God has something more. So, um, as I was thinking about this week, we're looking at um, what's so ordinary about an ordinary life. What, what is it that, uh, why, why do we want to have an ordinary life? Or what, what goes into that? Or maybe God has something different for us than just our ordinary life. And I realized that uh, so often we get these mental pictures in our mind. Um, in the old days, in the Wayback Machine, uh, Eileen and I were a marriage counselor years and years ago, for four years and years, and, uh, and uh, the, the counselor said, uh, you know, John, you, you get like this Polaroid in your mind, and then no, nothing else works for you, and, and uh, you don't know what a Polaroid is because you're young people, you know, but actually that was like a, a picture. <laughs> so anyway, so um, uh, we, we get that, and then, we, and then we misinterpret what's going on, and this happens so often in the Bible. When, when we have a... a a story in the Bible or Jesus gives us a mental image and, and we don't hear the words and what's going on underneath it because we just lock in on some image that we have. And uh, I, was, I was reading this book uh, this week, The Gospel According to Starbucks, um, which Eileen found for me at Value Village and looks like it's been through the washing machine. But um, anyway, uh, Leonard Sweet, who's one of my favorite writers, uh, he, he tells the story. Early in the 1988 presidential election campaign, when the Democratic nominee, Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis, actually was leading Vice President Bush in the polls, my granddaughter Sarah happened to be watching the nightly news with her parents. Sarah heard Tom Brokaw report the findings of the latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll. Vice President George Bush is closing the gap, Brokaw announced. Sarah turned to her parents in tears. I love that story. She well, why, why would he want to close the gap? <laughs> I agree with her. <laughs> why would he do such a thing? But you know, the thing is that just like that, uh, we, we get these ideas in our mind and then we hear things and we interpret it our own way and, and we may actually miss what's being, what's being communicated. And uh, I want to draw your attention to a passage in, in the Gospel of John. And this is such a familiar passage that it's easy for us to lock in on some idea, some mental image that we have, and, and not hear what it is that uh, God might have to say fresh and new to us. So I want you not to be crying about Bush closing the gap, okay? I want you to hear what, what Jesus is saying. Uh, Jesus said in uh, John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They'll come in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's hired and cares nothing for the sheep. But I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are in another uh, sheep pen. I'll bring them also. They'll also listen to my voice. And there's going to be one flock and one shepherd. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us from this passage that in some ways is so familiar and yet uh, we need to hear fresh and new today. And show us, Lord, what you can do in our ordinary lives. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, you all know that I had a little controversy with the publisher this summer uh, because I, I was so excited about the, a new book called Buckling Swash. You know, <laughs> they thought it would sell zero copies. 
Um, the subtitle was Finding Adventure in Your Ordinary Life. And the editor wrote back and said, who do you know that has an ordinary life? And I was ready to write the list and I couldn't think of anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's life is not ordinary, really, you know. And, uh, and I hate to have a teachable moment like that where I'm actually wrong. Um, so I went to this passage and I thought, what is it that, this is almost like the epicenter of, um, uh, of Jesus' mission and ministry. He tells us the reason that he came and was born as a baby in Bethlehem and grew up and lived and died on the cross and rose from the dead. The whole reason for that is in this passage. And yet we often just go right by it. Something about sheep and goats and stuff. I don't know. Uh, we go by it. Here's the epicenter of, of his whole mission. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's why I've come. That your life would be full. That you'd, you'd have a life. And not just an ordinary life, but you'd have a life that, that is full. Um, so I, I, I actually looked up that, uh, you know, well known Greek zoe is life, but the, uh, the other word is, is it, it's so crazy. It's, um, we, we know abundance, but super abounding in quality and quantity. It exceeds, it excels, it increases beyond measure. And, and one, uh, one definition uh, in, the, in the Greek dictionary was that it, it was violent. And I thought, well, how could this be violent, this life that is so overwhelming and, and beyond what we could believe and all those things? What makes it violent? It's that phrase, it just knocks you over. We are knocked over, overwhelmed by the abundance of the life that Jesus has come to give to us. Does that sound like an ordinary life to you? Not mine. Mine's usually a lot more ho-hum. Uh, and, and I'm going, if that's why he came, why are we missing this? What, what needs to happen in us so that we feel like we're actually physically knocked out by the abundance of what, of what God wants to do in us and what he's doing through us? Uh, how, how do we experience that? Um, that, got, that got me wondering. And so, um, looking at this passage, I'm going, um, Jesus is the gate, he says. You know, he has two images. One is the gate and one is the, the good shepherd. And, uh, but then he's, he's warning about uh, these thieves and robbers who, who come in, uh, who don't know the sheep, and, um, and he says, that, that's not me. I'm the good shepherd who knows the sheep. I call them by name. They know me. They hear my voice. They follow me. Um, I'd lay down my life for them. I'm not like the thieves and robbers. So I'm thinking, okay, we've got this image of this abundant life that would just knock us over with its abundance. And then we have this image of there are those that, that would rob us of our life, that would take that away and make our life just dull and flat and, and meaningless. So, high tech here. What are some of the things that happen in a in a um, in an abundant life that God wants to have for us? Well, one of them is, I think, and uh, is joy. And Jesus talks about joy all the time. My joy would be in you, and your joy would be full. Right? Almost a parallel passage to this. Um, and uh, and so uh, this idea that our life would have joy, and 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 not just joy, but also um, freedom. Not being bound up or feeling like our choices are limited or um, somehow uh, we're, we're just stuck, you know. Uh, in fact, it, Jesus talks about it here. He says, you know, the, the sheep uh, know me and they go in and out the gate. They, they, they have total freedom. They're not stuck in there. They're not stuck outside. They, there's a complete freedom to, to enter and leave and enter and leave. 
It's up to them. I know them, I love them. And, and this idea of our lives to be marked with joy and freedom that, that, that Christ wants us to have. And, uh, and then he says, you know, but you know, it's not just you all. It's not just you in this little group. He said, you know, there's, there's a lot of sheep out there. There's a whole bunch of sheep. In fact, he said, you know, I got a whole other flock over here you don't even know about. I'm still their shepherd. He said, there's a lot of flocks. They're one shepherd, right? That's what he says. And, and, and sometimes, you know, in church, we get this thing of, you know, well, let's get everybody to be like us. Or let's only invite the people who are like us. You know, I found very few people like me, so, uh, you know, that's a small church, you know, very small group. Uh, I don't even want to be in it, but, um, but the thing is, this is what happens all the time, you know, so, so church uh, gets smaller and smaller and tighter and tighter because we want it to be people like us and people who think like us and look like us, and, and if they don't act like us at first, they will soon, we'll train them, we'll, we'll get them church broke, you know, so they can potty train spiritually, you know, and, uh, and then they'll be like us, everything will be okay, and Jesus is going, no, 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 there's a whole bunch of sheep. And they're all different. And I'm the shepherd. They respond to me. I call them by name. They hear me. They respond. And, and I think we've lost track of the fact that in Christ, our uniqueness becomes more apparent. Not, not less. We become more different than the people around us. We become more ourselves. We don't, we don't come into relationship with Jesus and then start shriveling up, you know. It's like he wants us to be the people he's created us to be and to come alive and, and to uh, experience the joy and freedom and celebrate the fact that we're different and then celebrate the uniqueness of the people around us. Uh, I mean, that's one of the things that, that, that excites me about our little Harbor Church here is that I haven't found anybody who's like anybody else. Isn't that weird? You'd think that there'd just be a general thing, but there actually isn't. And when we look around and we talk to each other and everything, we find out, you know that each one of us has actually had a different life than the other person? We've had different experiences. We, we, we actually came from different families sometimes, right? Uh, does God want us to stop doing that? No. We celebrate that. We go, isn't that great? That, that God's love is so great that with all our uniqueness, that's what makes us special. And we've got this freedom and we have joy, right? And, and we're going along. And then, uh, and in the midst of this, you know, our faith grows. We learn to trust God. We learn, we learn that, uh, that Jesus is for us and he's not against us. We, we learn that, uh, that we can trust him. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. We, we start to begin to, to experience that. We go, even when I'm in the worst stuff, I realized that God's there with me, you know, that Jesus didn't leave me in that. And, and we, just, we experience healing like we heard about today and some great miracles. And we're praying for some that still haven't happened yet, but we're expecting. And so our faith grows. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a, this is a good life, isn't it? That's a good life. We have a life that's marked with joy and freedom and uniqueness and faith. How cool is that? Wait, I'm sorry. I have the church here. Well, what's he talking about? Okay, so there's joy, freedom, uniqueness, and faith. All right, so um, now the thieves come in. So the thieves and robbers come in, and, um, and they want to destroy, they want to take away. They'll take away the joy. They'll take away the freedom. They'll take away the uniqueness, make us all the same. They'll take away our faith. All those things happen. But, but then I thought, wait a minute, have you ever been robbed? Any of you ever been robbed? A few of you? Okay. Uh, you know, we had our home invasion thing years ago with Eileen, and she's never recovered from it. But um, I thought, what was it that, that the uh, person took? It took away having a life without fear. That, that, that's what was taken away. It did, I don't even remember what he took, really, you know. Probably a TV, but you know that was one of those big ones, those heavy ones. You know, good luck to him trying to sell that on eBay. You know now, you know it really takes a perspective. You know, uh, but um, uh, fear replaces 
all of these things. And, and, and I think that what Jesus does when he comes into our life and he shows us a life that's abundant and full and overpowering, it's the uh, helping us live beyond this fear that the robbers and thieves would bring so that we can experience joy, freedom, uniqueness, and faith. So I think that's what he has in mind for us. And, and uh, the, the robbers come in in different ways, you know? I mean, there's always, uh, especially in Seattle, there's, there's always some new uh, way of approaching life and stuff, and uh, um, a new religion pops up, a new way of living, a new approach. And usually it's, it's uh, kind of a, a smattering of good teachings without Jesus, basically. You know, it's, it's fairly okay stuff, you know. Um, in fact, I was thinking, you know, I should probably start a religion, be a cult leader. You know, all you do is you take Jesus out and then, oh no, then you have fear. Yeah, see, that's what you get. And, and uh, so that doesn't really work. But, but Jesus is saying, you know, I've laid down my life for the sheep because I know them, they're, they're, they're mine. You belong to me. And, and I will protect you and I would give my own life so that you can have joy and freedom and, and be the unique person that you're meant to be, created in God's image, and that your faith would grow and, and, and be strong and that you would live in spite of the fear. In spite of the fear, your life would be marked uh, so much more than that. Now, How does this happen? How does this happen? Um, you know, it's an interesting thing. When we gather to worship here, here at the harbor, you know, and, and, and when we sing these songs, and we think, that's, that's nice. We, you know, we kind of know them now, don't we? They're, they're sort of familiar. And uh, I noticed today, you know, a song started, Sheila kind of got up and went, uh, what's the key? Okay, boom, let's just play along, you know. And we had some kids playing drums and rattling stuff here and everything. And, uh, you know, it's like we know it. It's what, and we think, well, that's that's us. You know, it's a weird thing. Um, we don't talk about this much in here. But, you know, uh, Dave Doherty, uh, who sometimes leads the worship team and is part of it, um, uh, he wrote a song. Um, Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. Um, and, and that's a good song. We sing it every once in a while here at the harbor. Um, but I want to tell you something. I, I, uh, years ago, I was in Kyrgyzstan, and, and we found this group of Christians that were meeting in a little movie theater in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, there was a physician who was a Christian there, a uh, Kyrgyz gentleman, and uh, he got up to start the worship service. And in Kyrgyz, they sang, Come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Dave's song. And then uh, I went with a, a group from our Walnut Creek Church to uh, northern India. We were up in the villages, way up. Uh, uh, we had guards with machine guns in front of our rooms at night. Uh, really confident building. Um, and, and we were in this one little village, and, and they wanted to do some worship with us with the kids of the village. And they had this weird kind of drum machine and kind of a box accordion -y thing. And, they, and we all gathered around, and they started playing Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord. Dave song. I go, wow. There's something that is binding us together. And, and I think that God is doing something in us that says, um, what I'm doing is so much bigger than what you think. And it's so much bigger than your experience. And, and that is that um, I'm working with my sheep all over the world and drawing them together uh, in worship and praise and so that their lives can be full, almost violently so, just knocked over with the abundance of it, uh, that it just knocks us down, that it's so overwhelmingly good and he is saving us from having an ordinary life. Have you ever thought, what did Jesus save you from? Well, he saved you from having an ordinary life. You don't have to have that. You don't have to have the life that maybe your parents told you, well, that's all you're going to be. Better get used to it. You know? Or maybe you were told, well, you know, this is the way it is. You know, 
Um, I was told I had a, a teacher in high school, a German teacher, Herr Leon, and uh, he thought I was the biggest loser that ever, ever crossed the doorway of his classroom at Point Loma High in San Diego. And uh, a couple years later, I was coming out of a thing at San Diego State, the head of the, was a master's in counseling, and uh, I'd become friends with the head of the program, and, and I was walking out of his office, and there was Herr Leon wanting to go in and apply for the program. And he looked at me and he went, aren't you a truck driver yet? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, in his mind, it was like, you, you never amount to, well, I think being a truck driver is kind of cool personally, but I wish I could, <laughs> I aspire to it. But, um, it, it, you know, people will do that and they'll, and they'll want to make your life ordinary. They're the thieves and robbers. They're the thieves and robbers who say, you, this is all you have, just get used to it. Just settle, settle for that. Don't, don't ask for more. Don't ever ask God for more. Don't, don't ever uh, expect anything to happen in your life. Why pray, really? You know, God doesn't care, you know. You're just one of millions. And, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Your life can be extraordinary. It is extraordinary. It's, it, it's, it's extraordinary enough that I would lay down my life for you. That's how extraordinary your life is. Jesus said, I would give up my own life for you to have a life that's full and abundant and not dominated by fear. I want my life to be marked with joy and freedom and uniqueness and faith. I want that. Sometimes I see it starting to emerge, you know. I don't even need robbers and thieves from the outside. I've got them inside myself going, yeah, well, what do you think? You know, I've got those, there, I can rob myself of the joy. Isn't that cool? I'm gifted. So, you know, but, um, but Jesus said, no, 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 no. I'm the good shepherd. You don't have to live by fear. You don't have to have fear shading your freedom and who you are as God's creation and your faith and your joy. Let me live in you. I think that this is getting to the epicenter of Jesus' whole ministry. He didn't come here to start a new religion. He came here to give you life and to help you live beyond an ordinary life. And he came so that um, you don't have to be held back by fear or by other people's expectations or anything. That there's no limits and that the blessings in your life are so great that they actually knock you down. They're that overwhelming. I'm kind of afraid to ask for that. I don't know if I can handle blessings like that. So what? So am I going to say no to God? Am I going to say, no, Jesus, go bless some others. I'm okay, right? Or do we say, Lord, have your way in us. Have your way in us today, this week, in the middle of this really hard thing you're going through. Show us your blessing there. In the middle of this big failure, show us your blessing there. In the middle of this fear that's growing, show us your blessing there. And then I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. But pray with me. Lord Jesus, have your way in us. Come into our lives today, fresh, new way. Overcome whatever thieves and robbers have done to instill fear in us, to squelch our faith or stifle our joy, or get us to try and fit in and conform, hold back our freedom, anything that happens, Lord, we pray that you would just overwhelm it with your grace. And we thank you that you know us, you call us by name, and you, um, Lay down your life for us. Help us to experience that 
today and overcome anything that would push you away. Amen.